probably most of you don't actually require convincing that you're not currently some brain in a vat someplace, that you are in fact here in the room with me. I really did just make you get up and touch your toes and things. Um, that could be true. It could not be true. You might be a brain in, in a vat someplace, kind of <laughs> figuring out the universe. But for today, let's all pretend to agree that we're really here, OK? Good. <laughs> Which is great and all. But most of the time, we actually treat our brain, and even more so our mind, you know, comes out of 100 billion or so neurons. We treat it as being this disembodied thing, separate from this kind of bag of flesh that you wander around in. You think of them as two different things, even though really probably most of you know they're not. So your brain is this 100 billion or so neurons. It's encased in your skull. There are some physical constraints. If you ever happen to be unfortunate enough to get brain cancer, what will kill you is the tumor squashing your brain inside this skull. It's a real physical thing. And it's part of your body. It's made up of a part of your nervous system that's inextricably linked to the rest of your body. And what that means is the state of your body dramatically affects your ability to think. The way you take care of the rest of you has huge implications for how your brain functions. You may have seen The Matrix. So in The Matrix, we're all these human things in a brain in a vat, hooked up, acting as batteries for the alien robot overlords. I don't think anyone really knows what actually happened in Matrix 2. We'll ignore that. <laughs> when, in fact, the reverse is absolutely true. Your brain is this hyper-consuming energy fiend, and it relies explicitly on a continuous stream of a very single fuel, the sugar glucose. So glucose gets to your brain, and I apologize for being slightly sciencey here, right? So here's a neuron, one of your brain cells. Here's an astrocyte, also one of your brain cells, but we're not one of the ones we think of. It's one of the ones that supports the neurons. Glucose comes out of the blood, so you've all had lunch, and it made you bounce up and down a little bit. You've got slightly higher glucose. It's going through proteins called glucose transporters, commonly called glutes. All these little dots are different kinds of glutes. I'm not going to go into molecular details, but I am going to foreshadow the fact that one of those, called GLUT4, is the same glucose transporter you'd find on a muscle cell or a fat cell to get glucose out of the blood into those cells. It's regulated by insulin. That same molecule is found in your brain. And so what I'm going to talk about in part today is, OK, there are all these things that get glucose to your brain. What happens when it goes wrong? Your brain shuts down. Your brain can't use fat. Your brain can't use protein. Your brain can't even use other sugars. It can only use the one sugar glucose. We'll see it in a little bit. The sugar fructose, in particular, is commonly found as a sweetener in your diet today. Your brain doesn't notice. So when you take in that fructose, the only place it goes is your waistline. Your brain doesn't stop getting hungry. That's a problem. We'll come back to that. What I'm going to talk about then is how things that affect your body, your diet, your exercise, your stress level, that kind of stuff, how those relate to your ability to have good, strong cognitive performance, making memories, solving logic challenges, all that kind of thing. You've got a nice diet, you work out regularly, you sleep at night, you're unstressed, you're Einstein. Congratulations. <laughs> There's a flip side, right? If you get a poor diet, if you're stressed out chronically, this isn't the, the small alert, this is the lo chronic long-term stress, if you don't actually make it to the gym, then you end up with conditions like type 2 diabetes and obesity, and they're definitely linked very strongly to cognitive impairment, not so, just in the short term. One of the key points of today's talk is that research in my lab and some others has shown there's a very strong link between type 2 diabetes and obesity, in particular, and your lifelong chance of getting Alzheimer's disease. So it's not just today that it's affecting you, but for decades into the future, these lifestyle things, these things that are affecting your body, are also affecting your brain and your cognitive performance. So you've got this glucose. But right now, you're sitting here. It's about an hour after lunch. Much of that glucose has gone through your system. And you know, you're sitting there kind of sluggish for the past half an hour or so. Your brains aren't actually working optimally. We know it's been replicated you know, 100 times. If I gave this half of the audience a little glucose drink, and I gave you guys, sorry, saccharin, these guys would get more out of the talk. We can do this. If I gave you a hard math test, the same is true. But why is that the case? Why should we be set up so that our brain doesn't work at its best all the time? Part of the answer to that is that you can think of your brain as being like a car engine. And it's not a bad analogy. Yes, you could rev your car at 8,000 revs and be in that little red zone all the time. And if you needed to go 140, you could do it. But most of the time, you don't need or want to go 140. 
And if you keep it up at 7,000 revs, you'll burn out the engine really, really fast. The same is true for your brain. There are conditions where you have chronic excess of fuel supply and metabolism. Diabetes is the big one. What that does is literally kill your brain cells. If your cells are working too hard, if they're burning too much fuel, they will eventually just give up and commit cellular suicide. So you don't want to be constantly revving at max ability. There's one other reason why you might want your brain to have some reserve capacity, some ability to think a little better. If you're like most people, you just jumped a little bit. Your heart rate's going. You will remember this slide better than some of the other slides. Why? Okay, first of all, because it's freaky. And second, it's all about brain glucose, okay? What has happened is your heart rate's gone up, your blood flow has gone up, the supply of glucose to your brain has increased. In evolutionary terms, a tiger jumped out, and you want to remember where that tiger is. The blood supply is a signal. That bump of excitation, that bump of epinephrine, adrenaline, blood, all those things serve to indicate this was important. Remember this thing more than the color of the shirt of the lady sitting next to you. That's probably not important. Yeah. So things that supply blood glucose, things that make you slightly aroused, things that give you food, are important signals in evolutionary terms. Our brain is set up to remember them a little bit better. We can actually measure this directly. So, a lot of the work my lab does is using rats. Um, we heard earlier about what people will sign in terms of turns and conditions. I've done the experiment. If you give undergrads at the beginning of the semester a sheet to sign, they will sign it, even though it says, I give Professor McNay the permission to take my brain out at the end of the semester. They, they still sign it and give it back. <laughs> but their parents get mad. So most of the work we do looks at glucose and performance and so on in rats. And here's one of my rats. He's running around a very simple maze, and you can see we have the ability to measure his brain glucose in certain brain regions during the test without stressing the rat in any way. We can use rats because it turns out the molecules that different animals use to make memories are just the same as those in humans. This guy, Eric Kandel, won the Nobel Prize for working out some of the molecular mechanisms of memory. And the organism he's holding, this kind of liver-looking thing, is it's called a plesia. It's a giant sea slug. Now, plesia only have about 100 or so neurons, but the molecules they use to make memories with those neurons are the exact same molecules that the rat uses and that we use. So we can actually do a lot of this work and get directly comparable results across species. When we do that, finally, some data, right? So this is a measure of brain glucose. This is the glucose left in the hippocampus, which is a brain structure primarily responsible for making memories for allowing you to understand, in the rat's case, where you're going in the maze. And what you can see is that as soon as you put the rat on the maze, you get this drainage. Glucose supply to the brain can't keep up with the demand of that cognitive challenge. That rat's in the same condition that you guys are before you heard the scream. Now you've heard the scream. Now you've got a little extra glucose. If we give this rat a glucose drink just before putting him on the maze, what you see is he does a lot better. In fact, his performance on the maze goes up in this task about 150%. So his ability to spatially navigate and form good memories is really quite markedly enhanced. And the glucose is no longer drained. So what you've done is increase the salience, increase the ability of the rat to form memories at that particular point in time just because of brain glucose. It turns out a whole bunch of things work this way. So glucose, stress, that slide, small amount of stress. Me being up here on stage, really nervous. Small amount of stress. Exercise. Caffeine. Excellent. Um, insulin. One of the most recent advances from my lab and from others is to show that insulin is not just this peripheral signal. It doesn't just work in the muscles and fats. It works in the brain, too. It's a key component of brain and memory and hippocampus. So we'll see in a minute that hippocampal insulin resistance is a symptom of whole body insulin resistance. When your brain's ability to use insulin goes down, so does your ability to make memories and to think well. So a little bit of excitation is a good thing. Too much of a good thing, though, is really, really bad. Take stress as an example. A small amount of acute stress, great. Sitting in traffic for three and four hours a day, unable to get out of it, constantly beating your fist against the steering wheel and swearing at the lady in front of you who can't drive, that's chronic, unescapable stress that will absolutely, literally, kill your brain cells. 
the hormones that are released, glucocorticoids, will overexcite those neurons, they will kill themselves, and you'll end up with lifelong cognitive impairments. Not a good thing. If you have too little sleep, if you're getting too much glucose to the brain on a chronic basis, that's diabetes. And what diabetes does is cause your nerves to die so you go blind and you have to lose your feet because they get amputated. So you go over the curve, this inverted U dose response curve. Too much of these things is bad. And of course, they're linked together. There's not time to go into all the links between these variables. But things like stress. If you're chronically stressed, you tend to eat too much, which means you gain weight. You tend not to sleep very well. And you become insulin resistant as a consequence of some of the hormones released by that stress. Fructose. I mentioned that fructose doesn't get to the brain. It can't go through the glucose transporters that lead to the brain. It can only go through the ones in the gut. And it's very effective, much more effective than glucose, at forming fat. So what happens is you drink your fructose drink. Your brain doesn't notice. And it doesn't send any signals to say, OK, I've had some food. You can stop now. So hunger continues. But all those calories go to your gut. This is not a good thing. Unfortunately, diet drinks don't work either. Drinking artificial sweeteners with no calories simply teaches your brain, oh, sweetness no longer signals calories. Great, I'll have 10. And so the next time you take in something sweet, again, you've disrupted the signal that says sweetness means fuel for the brain. Both of those end up causing weight gain. It's been shown very clearly. Consuming diet soda leads to gaining weight. It's not helpful, but it's a fact. <sighs> Lastly, insulin resistance. One of the things I'm going to talk about primarily here if you are whole body insulin resistant, if you're type 2 diabetic, if you've been having all this fructose, if you are markedly obese, then that will feed back to your brain. It'll cause high blood pressure. It'll probably lead to accumulation of stress. It'll certainly make you obese. It'll cause an impairment of glucose because you have too much glucose constantly surrounding your brain. The diagram on the left could be taken from a muscle cell or a fat cell. What it shows is simply that glucose is moved into the cell Here's the cell membrane right here, as a consequence of insulin binding to its receptor. So insulin binds to the receptor, activates this glucose transporter, GLUT4, to go up to the cell surface and pull glucose in. This could be a muscle cell or a fat cell. It could also be a hippocampal neuron. And we know, in fact, that what insulin does in the hippocampus is help you form better memories by helping glucose go into your cells. So glucose, like insulin, has an inverted U response curve. A little bit of extra insulin to the hippocampus makes you smarter. And if you measure brain metabolism after you give that insulin, what you see is it goes up and stays up as long as you're giving extra insulin. So you really are supporting better function in your hippocampus with that little extra bit of insulin because it's increasing glucose metabolism, because it's helping your cells get the fuel they need. If we make our rats diabetic, and we do this by giving them, well, I used to call it a high-fat diet except it's less fat and better balanced than the average American human diet. Nonetheless, when you give them this diet, many of them become markedly obese. They become insulin resistant and diabetic. And you can test that. We call it diet-induced obesity. And what you see is it's not just peripheral. It affects their brain. And so these are the guys in red. The green guys are what I just showed you. The red guys are impaired on this spatial memory task, both under baseline conditions when we're not doing anything but also in response to giving them a little bit of extra insulin. Their brain can no longer respond to insulin. It's insulin resistant. If you look at metabolism, you see the same thing. Again, the green trace I just showed you for normal animals. For these diet-induced obese, these type 2 diabetic animals, you put insulin in, and the hippocampus goes, eh, nothing happens. No boost to metabolism. The brain's markedly resistant and associated with this big cognitive impairment. That's short term. I mentioned the long term is somewhat scarier. So this is one of the first studies we've known for almost 20 years now. That there's a big risk of developing Alzheimer's disease as a consequence of type 2 diabetes. If you're not one of about the 5% of folks who have a really strong genetic predisposition for Alzheimer's, the single biggest risk factor for developing Alzheimer's dementia is being type 2 diabetic. It's been replicated several times, several large studies. Depending on which one you look at, your risk goes up anywhere from 100 to maybe 700%. Probably on average, about a 200% chance increase of developing Alzheimer's disease. What we know, these are data from the CDC, is that type 2 diabetes is markedly on the rise. You know, just look around you, people are getting fatter, the number of type 2 diabetic patients is greatly increasing. 
These data are four years old. I promise you it hasn't got better since then. Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's Association will tell you we're going to expect this wave of Alzheimer's coming right along the pike. It's one of the incre increasingly leading causes of death, particularly amongst older folks. And what's happening then is right now you have a wave of obesity and type 2 diabetes, and it's going to arrive at the shore as a wave of Alzheimer's disease. This is not a public health talk, but think about what that's going to do to health costs in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Go back to biology for a second. And this is the most biological I'm going to get, so bear with me. What's going on? Why is type 2 diabetes causing Alzheimer's disease? There are actually several answers. Here's one of the most likely and most compelling. Under normal conditions, it turns out, both insulin and the small peptide called A-beta, amyloid beta, which is the characteristic hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, both those peptides are broken down by the same enzyme. It's called IDE, insulin-degrading enzyme. And normal healthy brains, great. You've got plenty of IDE. It breaks down both these peptides, gets rid of them. In the insulin-resistant case, you've got too much insulin. What that means is that all of the IDE is spending all of its time breaking down the insulin, and there's no capacity left over, or not sufficient, to break down the A-beta, the beta amyloid, which builds up. That buildup of beta amyloid, we think, is certainly a major causative factor, and it's the key hallmark of the Alzheimer's condition. Even worse, that beta amyloid then turns right around and binds to insulin receptors. And so what you actually end up with is this model where in the diseased type 2 diabetic brain, the beta amyloid is blocking the insulin receptors, meaning you can't get glucose into the neurons when you need it. And if you look at human Alzheimer's patients, one of the key hallmarks, key symptoms, and key causes of deficits is this brain hypometabolism, inability to use glucose adequately. All right, that was all doom and gloom. What can you do? Title of the talk, 10 second version, go to the gym, right? So all these things are good, better diet, better sleep, less stress. It turns out, okay, exercise can't actually give you caffeine, so go to the gym and then have coffee. <laughs> but definitely go to the gym, because exercise boosts all of these things, every single one. It improves your glucose regulation. It gives you better blood flow to the brain. It reduces your stress level, makes you more resilient to future stress. So again, not just right now, but for hours, days, and weeks after you've been to the gym, you're better protected against Alzheimer's disease. It improves insulin sensitivity, reduces your body fat. In the long term, it makes you sleep better at night, and you won't get Alzheimer's. So going to the gym, remembering that your brain is in this body. Mental exercise is great. Doing crossword puzzles, playing Scrabble, playing bridge, all those things really do help. Your brain really is, in some ways, a muscle. If you don't use it, it will fall apart. But if I have to give you the five-second version, remember that your brain is inside a body, and treat the body right, and get it to the gym so that your brain can keep functioning.